This week in wrestling history, a very Royal Rumble heavy segment this week. It is that time of year. But we begin with a very important date. 58 years ago this week on January 24th, 1963, Kennedy was still alive. And Luthez beat Buddy Rogers in Toronto to win the NWA World Heavyweight title. Promoters in the Northeast refused to recognize the title change because the match was only one fall at a time when all title matches were typically two out of three falls. As a result, they broke away from the NWA and they formed a new group called the World Wide Wrestling Federation, which today is called WWE. Now, the real reason for the split had to do with the fact that Vince McMahon Sr. and Toots Mont controlled Buddy Rogers' booking. That's still just a fantastic name, by the way. Toots Mont. And they controlled his bookings, and they wanted to keep the NWA title in their territory. Other promotions were very upset over this, and that led to the split. So the one-fall excuse was really just a cover reason Rogers was later named the first WWF champion after winning a fictional tournament in Rio de Janeiro. It would not be the last fictional tournament in Rio de Janeiro that WWE used to crown a new champion. And a month later, Rogers dropped the title to Bruno San Martino in 48 seconds in Madison Square Garden to kick off Bruno's First reign with the title, which is still the longest of all time, 2,803 days. Nearly eight years did Bruno reign as the champion. Now that reign came to an end in shocking fashion 50 years ago this very week on January 18, 1971 at the hands of Ivan Koloff, or I should say, at the, at the knee, not so much the hands, but the knee of Ivan Koloff, who hit a top rope knee drop and pinned the champion before a stunned crowd at Madison Square Garden. And you, and you wonder why MSG is so revered in wrestling and revered by this company, you know, WWE. It's where all the big moments happen. But those in attendance said that it was so quiet. It was so quiet after the finish that you could have heard a pin drop People could not believe what they had seen. San Martino said that he thought something happened to his ears because it had gone so quiet. Bruno, by this point, he had been champion for so long. Bruno was exhausted. He was just tired. Claimed he never took a pain pill, never even took so much as an aspirin. Traveled the world. And he was just ready. It was time. He was ready to drop the belt. He begged them, I'm done. Take this off me. But they were so afraid of a riot after the finish of that match. Koloff, uh, in stories later, said the referee told him, get to the back. Get to the dressing room. You'll get the belt back there. And that's what they did. And I, I think it might have been uh, it might have been Bill After who got the first photos of Koloff in the back, posing with the championship on. Koloff was only a transitional champion, though. He held the title for three weeks before dropping it to Pedro Morales. 37 years ago this week, on January 23rd, 1984, the day that Hulkamania, which is was already a thing by that point in the AWA, it's not like Vince McMahon created it, but this was the day, though, you can't credit Vince McMahon with this, this was the day that Hulkamania exploded from a regional scene onto the national scene in WWE and paved the way for the rock and wrestling boom of the mid-1980s and really that whole golden era of WWE that just sent the company like a rocket ship up into the stratosphere. One month earlier, the Iron Sheik had won the championship from Bob Backlund. And much like Ivan Koloff before him, he served as a transitional champion to get the title from one baby face onto another without the two of them having to wrestle. And Backlund did not want to go heel. They had approached him about that. He didn't want to do it. So they had to get the belt off him onto a bad guy to get it onto another good guy. And that's what they did. This was a show called Super Monday. That's what they dubbed this. Super Monday from where else? 
Madison Square Garden, with the Sheik defending against Hulk Hogan, who had only returned to the company four weeks before this. Hogan had only been back for about a month. Vern Gagne did not appreciate Hogan leaving the AWA in a huff the way that he did. Then again, if Vern Gagne had actually put the title on Hogan instead of giving the fans blue balls by constantly acting as if Hogan won the title and then yanking it away from him, maybe Hagen, maybe maybe Hogan would have actually stayed put. So you know what? Vern Gagne has nobody to blame for that but himself. But Vern Gagne was not very happy about Hogan leaving. And as the Iron Sheik has told the story, and again, this is his version of events, but he has always maintained this story. Vern Gagne called him. And he said, look, Sheiky, I want you to come back. Come back and I'll take care of you. He was going to pay him $100,000 to go into that match with Hogan because he knew that obviously Sheik would lose his job if he did this. He wanted Sheik to go into the ring that night at the Garden and break Hogan's leg during the match. And he would bring him back to the AWA, pay him hundred grand. Sheik, though said he had too much loyalty to Vince McMahon and his father, and he went to them. He actually went to the McMahons before the match. He went to both of them because by then Vince Sr. was still alive. He passed away uh, later that year. But he says he went to both McMahons before the match, and he admitted, look, I got a call from Vern Gagne. He told them what Vern had asked him to do, and he said that he wasn't going to go through with it because... You know, he had too much respect for them and respect for what they had done for him. Bruce Pritchard says that he once talked to Vince about it. And McMahon thought that Sheik was coming to him before the match to try to hold him up for more money. He was trying to shake him down. That's what he thought. But Sheik never asked for anything. He never asked for more money. Nothing, nothing like that. He just wanted Vince to know what Vern had asked him to do and said that he had too much respect for him and his father to go ahead and do that. And he went out there and he did the job. And with that win, Hogan launched the company, like I said, in just to the next level and beyond. He won his first of six WWE titles that night. And that first reign would last another four years. 33 years ago this week, on January 24th, 1988, the NWA went live on pay-per-view from the Nassau Coliseum. On Long Island, New York, that was WWE country, with its bunkhouse stampede, and things did not go well. For starters, WWE countered them by airing the first Royal Rumble event live on the USA Network. This was only a couple of months after WWE debuted the first Survivor Series. Head-to-head -head on pay-per-view to counter Starcade, And that pissed off the cable companies to no end because they ended up competing with each other, they had competing events on the same night on pay-per-view, or the same day. And this was just a disaster of a show for Crockett. A lot of tickets were printed with the wrong start time on them. So you had people showing up to the arena just before the main event was about to start. And the entire show itself lasted under two hours. Dusty Rhodes won the Bunkhouse Stampede Steel Cage Battle Royal. That's a mouthful. Meanwhile, the Royal Rumble on the same night, featured a contract signing between Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant for their big championship rematch on NBC a few weeks later, which is still to this day the most watched match in the history of American television. 33 million people. Hacksaw Jim Duggan won the very first Royal Rumble match, which only had 20 men instead of 30. And the Jumping Bomb Angels... They don't get talked about enough. Whenever I go back and I, I do happen to watch an old Jumping Bomb Angels match, they're fucking great. More people should watch the Jumping Bomb Angels. They beat the Glamour Girls two out of three falls to win the WWF Women's Tag Team titles. Now the 1991, 92, 97, and 2003 Royal Rumble events all took place on January 19th. The 91 show featured a fantastic opener with the Rockers beating the Orient Express. Maybe the best opening match in Royal Rumble history. And there have been some great ones since then, okay? Edge and Dolph Ziggler had a very good world title match to open the show in 2011. Daniel Bryan against Bray Wyatt. 
I think was the opener in uh, 2014. That that you know what to this day that I believe is still the best singles match of Bray Wyatt's career, whether it's as the Fiend or just as as Bray Wyatt. I don't think he's ever had a better match. I really don't think he's ever had a better singles match than the match he had with Daniel Bryan at that Royal Rumble in 2014. Kevin Owens and Dean Ambrose, they had a tremendous last man standing match for the Intercontinental title that opened the 2016 Royal Rumble. But this match with the Rockers and the Orient Express is so great. Such a great match. It also featured the big Virgil babyface turn on Ted DiBiase after their win over Dusty and Dustin Rhodes. Dusty Rhodes, by the way, he couldn't wait to get out of there. He was back in WCW less than two weeks later. And Hulk Hogan became the first man to repeat as a Royal Rumble winner. He went back-to-back, last eliminating, let's see, this was 91. So I think he eliminated Earthquake, right? Because it was Mr. Perfect in 1990. And in 91, I think it came down to Hogan, Earthquake, and and, uh, Brian Knobs. I think that was the final three. And uh, Hogan went back-to-back. The 1992 Royal Rumble match is still the greatest of all time and the first to be contested for the WWE Championship when the title was vacated after a controversial ending to the Hulk Hogan Undertaker match at Tuesday in Texas the month before. Ric Flair had only been in the company for a few months. He was walking around with the big gold NWA belt, which he took with him and refused to give back unless he was paid back the deposit that he put down. He claimed, you know, back in the day, when you were the champion, you had to put down a $25,000 deposit on that belt. And he said, I want to be paid back my $25,000. You pay me, I'll give you your belt back. If not, I'm keeping it. And in fact, the first thing he did when he was fired and left, you know, with the whole Jim Hurd situation was he called up Vince McMahon. He had flirted with coming to the company, and I think he actually had negotiations with Vince back in 88, and it just didn't work out. So they they knew each other. They were familiar with each other. They had spoken before. Vince was the first person Flair called after he left WCW in 91. And he called him, and he said, uh, hey, look, I can come in, or, you know, I'm, I'm free to come in. And I got the belt. And Vince said, what do you mean? He goes, the belt. I have it. Vince said, great, send it on over. (laughs) And so for weeks on the syndicated shows, you saw Bobby Heenan, who was doing the announcing. He was standing there holding the big gold NWA belt, flaunting it on television as they hyped up the imminent debut, which didn't happen until September, but the imminent debut of Ric Flair, who came in proclaiming himself to be the real world's champion. And by the time the Rumble rolled around, he didn't have the big gold belt anymore. They gave him a spare uh, WWF tag team belt to use, and they just video distorted it on TV. Imagine how that looked, though, to the people in the building, how stupid that looked. <laughs> when he would come out holding up a, a tag team belt, they must have been thinking, what the fuck is he holding that up for? But on TV, they they did their best to put a little, little video distortion over it. Flair entered the Rumble at number three. And he lasted an hour before winning the entire thing. In his book, Bobby Heenan, who had the best night of his career on commentary during this match, rooting for Flair, having a nervous breakdown at various points, he said that it was his idea for Flair to go the distance in that match, and his idea was that Flair would enter at number one. He would become the first man in Rumble history. There had only been a few of them by that point. But he would be the first man to enter at number one, and he would go all the way to the end. And Vince McMahon then took the idea, he says, and he changed it to put his own little spin on it, so he could take credit for it as his own idea. He said, well, instead of him coming out at number one, how about we have Flair come out at number three? And it came down to Hulk Hogan, Ric Flair, and Sid Justice. With Justice tossing Hogan out of the ring, much to the delight of the crowd in Albany, New York, who cheered. Hogan, though, the sore loser that he is, helped Flair eliminate Sid. He gave Flair the championship. He helped the heel win the championship because he was upset in a match where every man for himself, right? That's all they would tell us every year. It's every man for himself. He was upset. 
And so he helped Flair eliminate Sid. Sid did nothing wrong, but Hogan didn't care. Once again, showing his true heel colors as he did for so many years, all the back scratches and the eye rakes. I always get a kick out of, of Sid in the post-match pointing to a sign in the crowd that read Hulk who with a question mark. <laughs> you made sure you made sure that he pointed it out to Hogan and Hogan looked shook. He looked shaken up by the reaction. I, you know what? I, I never understood this. I never understood. Here's Hogan, right? Uh, clearly there was no plans of turning him heel. Hogan's a smart guy. You can say a lot of th things about Hogan, but he's not a dumb guy, okay? He didn't have the success that he had and stay on top for as long as he did for being stupid. How did he not realize how this was going to come off? How could he allow himself to be booked like this, where he was going to come across so badly? Even as, even as a young fan back then, I thought to myself, what is he doing? <laughs> why, why is he helping Flair win? It doesn't make any sense. He came off looking like such, just a whiny little bitch. He had to know that he was going to come off that way, but clearly the company, you know, they, they were caught off guard. They weren't expecting that kind of reaction. When they replayed the finish on TV, they had Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby Heenan in studio to record new commentary, and they edited the crowd noise to make it sound like the crowd booed when Sid dumped Hogan out of the ring. A little uh, crowd manipulation trick that they would use many years later for Roman Reigns on an episode of Raw. But backstage, Jack Tunney presented the title to Flair, and while Mean Gene Okerlund was interviewing the new champion, he interrupted his own interview. He turned, did Mean Gene to someone off camera, and told that person to put that cigarette out. Which, in the interview I did with Mean Gene a few years ago... You bet your ass I asked him that question. I said, what was up with that? Who are you talking to? What happened there? And he said it was just a staffer, some some kind of tech, technician or something who was off to the side, who was lighting up. He was lighting up a cigarette, and he told them to put it out. It was very simple. There really, it wasn't some overly sexy story. It's pretty much exactly as it was. It wasn't a planned spot or anything like that. Also on this night, Rowdy Roddy Piper won his first title in WWE, putting the Mountie to sleep to capture the Intercontinental Championship and also making Piper the first man to pull double duty at a Rumble pay-per-view when he wrestled in the Rumble match later on that night. He had the chance to walk out with two titles. He came close. He made it almost to the very end. Now, days before the show, Bret Hart dropped the Intercontinental title to the Mountie at a live event with the excuse given that he was he was heroically wrestling that night with a 104 degree fever, but, you know, he just, he was under the weather and he just couldn't do it. And the Mountie beat him and that's why Bret Hart lost the title. In reality, Bret was unhappy about being told that he was losing the title and he was a little worried that that meant he was being demoted down the card. And so around that time, I don't know how early this goes back to, but some somewhere around that time, he opened up negotiations with WCW. Because he was worried that Vince McMahon was going to start pushing him down the card, that this was the start of a slide for him. And so he opened up negotiations with the other company. Now, according to Brett himself, in a kayfabe commentary shoot that he did covering 1992, which I reviewed, actually, many years ago, elsewhere on this channel, reviewed that, uh, that whole video. But he said that Brian Pillman, who was working in WCW, was flying Brian at the time, and Pillman had a history of going back with Stu Hart and the Dungeon, and he was a friend of the family. Brian Pillman was the one who told Brett that, look, this is what I'm making in WCW, and I can get you that same deal if you want to come in. So Brett was ready to jump. He was going to jump ship to WCW until he realized that his contract had previously rolled over. So he thought his contract was coming due, didn't realize, I guess, the company had an option on him for another year, and it had rolled over. And so all of a sudden... He wasn't going to be free until September. 
So if he tried to jump, he would have to sit on the sidelines for many months. So he decided against making the move, and then word of the negotiations leaked to Dave Meltzer, and at that point he realized he couldn't trust the people in WCW. WCW's plan was to debut Bret Hart on their Clash of, 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 I keep saying Clash of Champions. It used to be Clash of the Champions, that's the proper name, not what uh, WWE called it. WCW had a Clash of the Champions show two days after the Royal Rumble. Their plan was to debut Bret on that show, possibly even with the Intercontinental Belt, which would have been impossible since Bret ended up dropping it to the Mountie. But that would have been their revenge for Ric Flair going to WWE with that big gold belt and putting it on TV. So we came very close to Bret Hart jumping ship to WCW in early 1992. So it's no wonder Vince McMahon felt like he had to get the belt off Bret in 97. (laughs) He was having flashbacks to five years earlier. The 1997 Rumble was held at the Alamo Dome in San Antonio, Texas, in front of 60,000 fans, which I am pretty sure that is still a rumble record. I know they've run some baseball stadiums in recent years. They've had 40 and 50,000. I'm pretty sure 60 in 97 is still the record. The paid attendance for the show is actually 48,000. Per the Observer at the time, five days before the pay-per-view, they only had 28,000 tickets sold. They had a lot of coupons out at Taco Bell's in the area for discounted tickets. It is believed that the Taco Bell promotion resulted in another 20,000 tickets being sold. The power of Taco Bell ended up being the second largest paid attendance in the history of pro wrestling in the U.S. up to that point, behind only WrestleMania three, According to Bruce Pritchard, They had been running so many shows at smaller venues in 1996, they really wanted this to be an impressive visual. That's why they ran such a large building, they ran a big dome, because they just wanted to break this uh, sort of cycle of, oh, WWF can only run small buildings. So they were adamant that they put the Rumble in a big building, and it didn't even matter to them exactly how many tickets they sold. As long as it was enough people to make for an impressive looking visual that was you wanted the appearance of a large crowd and so according to Pritchard that's why they ran the building and that's what they were going for we also had to see we got to see good old JR for the first time in the black cowboy hat which has become a staple of his career but it was something Vince McMahon had been trying to get him to do since 1994 and JR fought he didn't want to do it and finally they were in Texas and Vince said you should wear the cowboy hat And so JR finally acquiesced, and the rest is is history. He's been wearing it ever since. You can't take that hat off his head. Stone Cold Steve Austin won his first of three Royal Rumble matches, an all-time record. Last eliminating Bret Hart after Bret had already tossed him out, but the referees were distracted. I think it was by a fight outside, I think, between Mick Foley and Terry Funk. So while their attention was diverted... Austin slithered back into the ring, and he tossed Brett out. Unfortunately for him, the referees did see that, and they anointed uh, Austin as the winner. This was not the original finish. Austin was not supposed to win the Royal Rumble in 1997. And you have Vince Russo to thank for that change, bro. Russo at the time was doing his Vic Venom character, like in the WWF magazine, He would make appearances as Vic Venom on the Livewire show on Saturday mornings, which was their their live call-in show, which produced many, many gems. I don't know if that's on the network. If not, I hope they get get working on that. They should get those old episodes of Livewire up on the network. But anyway, he was doing that at the time. And on one of the episodes of Livewire, he was asked for his prediction for the Royal Rumble match. Who do you think is going to win the Royal Rumble? Well, Vic Venom said it's going to be Bret Hart, of course. <laughs> and Vince McMahon was was there, and he was said to be furious when the show was over or they went to commercial or whatever. McMahon was furious at Russo for spoiling the outcome of the match, and Russo told him, he said, look, nobody told me what the outcome is going to be. It, it was just obvious. It was the most predictable answer that Bret Hart was going to win the Royal Rumble. 
So he was only saying what he thought was the most predictable outcome. But because of that, Vince McMahon decided to change the finish because he felt Russo had given it away. It was too obvious. And that is why Austin won. And we got that whole convoluted thing where it ended up in the, the final four match. And then, of course, Sean lost his smile and everything pretty much got blown up at that point. Speaking of which, Sean here on this night in his hometown was fighting the flu, regained the WWF title from Psycho Sid. He was up in the bathroom all night the night before. He slept most of the day away in Vince McMahon's office. He was just trying to... He just was trying to get out there and just work the match and, and be done with it. It was not his best match. The 2003 Royal Rumble featured the first ever stepmother versus stepdaughter match. I talked about this a few weeks ago. This was the match between Tori Wilson and Dawn Marie... Stemming from the horrible Al Wilson angle where Don married Tori's father. They had a short, terrible match on this show. Wasn't very good. And that was the end of the program. But according to Don Marie, it was originally scheduled to continue on and involve Tori's brother at some point. And I don't even want to ask what the idea was there. <laughs> it's bad enough this woman went after Tori's father. Now they wanted to bring in Tori's brother. What kind of sick fucks are these people? Thankfully, it didn't go that far. Triple H and Scott Steiner had one of the worst matches in Royal Rumble history. And I don't blame Triple H for this. An absolute embarrassment of a match, which, to be fair, it was hampered by the drop foot injury that Scott Steiner had been dealing with since he, since he left WCW. He had this foot injury that really uh, hampered his ability to, to do much, to do much of anything. But watching him get gassed out midway through and dropping Triple H on some of the suplexes he was giving him, people were booing them out of the building. And according to Lance Storm, Jack Lanza, who was one of the backstage agents, told him that the office had given up on Steiner after his performance in that match. As soon as the match was over, I don't know if they were having a conversation or he overheard him, but Lanza said that was it. They gave up on it right then and there. Even though they had a rematch the following month, they had to finish out the program. That was the moment that WWE gave up on Scott Steiner. And you know what? I don't blame him. It's a horrible, horrible match. It was, it was just, it was awful. But... Scott Steiner is a weird thing because when I think of Scott Steiner in the early 90s, he had the look. He was he was jacked up even then, but at a reasonable size, and he can move around, and he really was an incredible athlete. When he decided to just kind of blow himself up into this freakish comic book-like character, you know, on the one hand, it's what got him a main event run in WCW. That's what got Scott Steiner to finally reach the main event and become a world champion was that big Papa Pump character, but at what cost? Because his ring work suffered, he wasn't the same, he started getting hurt. You know, there's just a point in which you get so big and jacked up like that, that it just works against you. It's like, why would you do that to yourself? I, I can understand it, because again, it got him noticed, it got him a main event push, but was it worth it? Because he was not the same performer he was years earlier. And that had a lot to do with it. His size and how muscled up he was. You know, all the all the freaks and peaks he used to talk about with his arms and his biceps and everything. I mean, it, it really, it was not a good thing. Physically, it was not a good thing for him. But from the worst match in not only Royal Rumble history, but certainly, in my opinion, what was the worst match. And if, if it wasn't, then I would love to know what the worst one was. The worst match of the year, we go to one of the best matches of the year, and one of the best matches in Royal Rumble history immediately followed that between Kurt Angle and Chris Benoit for the WWE Championship. This match was fucking awesome. Angle retained the title, but the crowd gave Benoit a standing ovation when it was over. And, you know, just to really quickly just call back, I was talking a little bit earlier about The Undertaker and the comments on the Joe Rogan podcast and this idea of the product being softer and Drew McIntyre chiming in saying the, the in-ring product, no, it's not true. It's as physical now as it's ever been. 
And again, there's truth in that. And there's also, you know, parts of that that I don't agree with. I always think back to a match like this. I think of guys like Angle and Benoit when they were in the ring together, or even Brock. You can think of Brock Lesnar and people like that. That style of wrestling is something that you don't see in WWE today. It was, it was, it was safe, but I mean, these guys didn't hold back, you know, and they were, they laid their shit in. And I do think that is something that is missing from the product today. I'm not saying I want guys to get hurt. I want guys to have their teeth knocked out and get black eyes. Yeah, there's got to be a safe way to do it. But there was an intensity about it. There was an intensity about their in-ring style that I I do miss that. And I do think the product today, at least in WWE, uh, is, is really lacking. And I guess New Japan would be the closest thing I guess I could think of that exists today outside of what, outside of what Walter does in, in NXT UK. That New Japan style would be the closest thing to anything even resembling that. And that's part of the reason why I enjoy watching those big New Japan matches and those big main events. Because it is harder hitting. It is it, it is more of a fight. It's more of a battle, it feels like, than stuff that you would see on TV today. But Brock Lesnar did win his first Royal Rumble match that night and punched his ticket to WrestleMania where he would win the WWE Championship from Kurt Angle and nearly broke his neck in the process. 26 years ago this week on January 22nd, 1995, Shawn Michaels won the shortest Royal Rumble match ever on pay-per-view. On pay-per-view being the qualifier there, not counting the first one, which aired on USA Network. He started at number one, and he survived 38 minutes. That's how short this match was. 38 minutes he survived until the very end. They only had one-minute intervals that year. The idea was it's going to make the action faster-paced. I don't know if that really worked out that way that year or not, but it was not the uh, definitely not the best of the Rumble matches that they have done. And Michaels became the first entrant to go from number one all the way to the very end. It, it did give us one of the greatest, I thought, finishes in Royal Rumble history. One of the best fakeouts. We've seen a million copycats since, you know, dangling inches off the floor. Maybe not for the finish, but dangling off the floor. Only one foot touches. They, they do it to death these days. Kofi Kingston, it became an annual tradition, right? With him being thrown out of the ring and only landing on one foot. And how's he going to get back in? But at the time, it was a very clever finish, you know, with Shawn Michaels holding on for dear life. And they really wanted you to think the British Bulldog had won. They played his theme music. They took the camera off of Shawn, who was hanging outside the ring. And the music, though, is what really was like, whoa, what the, what, did he win? Is that, is that for real? And then, of course, Shawn Michaels came up from behind and knocked him off the ropes. And they showed the replay, and he did a hell of a job. Michaels, you know, they showed slow-mo, and, and he did a hell of a job holding on and barely touching the floor. It was a great finish. Not a great rumble, but a great finish. And uh, also on that night, Bob Holly and the 1-2-3 Kid beat Bam Bam Bigelow and Tatanka to win the vacant WWF Tag Team titles. This was to set up the post-match angle where Bigelow shoved NFL legend Lawrence Taylor right out of his seat because Taylor was laughing at Bam Bam. He was mocking him, and Bam Bam didn't take too kindly to that, so he shoved him, and that led to their WrestleMania main event that year. It was actually a really, whatever you think of the WrestleMania match, it really was a well-done, believable, like believably done angle at the Rumble with the shove that led to the match. 23 years ago this week on January 18, 1998, the Royal Rumble emanated from San Jose, California, with Stone Cold Steve Austin winning his second consecutive Rumble match, a match that also saw Mick Foley enter three different times under three different personas, Mankind, Dude Love, and Cactus Jack. Referee Jack Doan was rushed out of the building in an ambulance and hospitalized after Phineas Godwin was eliminated and came down with his boot, making contact with Doan's head. And he ended up with a concussion. One of my favorite match finishes, which doesn't get talked about enough, is actually from the opener on this show between Vader and Goldust. Luna Vachon was with Goldust at the time, and Vader was going for the Vader bomb. He was about to climb the ropes and go for the Vader bomb. Luna jumped on Vader's back, 
Well, that didn't stop Vader. He climbed up anyway. So now he's got Luna on his back and he hits the move. It's this awesome visual, even though Luna almost broke her face on the landing. But the place popped huge. I, I, I miss Luna. I miss Luna. I got to meet her twice. And uh, both times she was a very sweet lady. Shawn Michaels defeated The Undertaker in a casket match to retain the WWE Championship after Kane interfered and chokeslammed his brother into the casket and then set it on fire after the match because who among us has not done that to our little brother? Or I guess in this case, big brother. It was during this match that Michaels was backdropped out of the ring and he landed right on the small of his back, right on the edge of the casket. He didn't feel pain right away. He said it was a few days later when he started to feel a stabbing sensation in his lower back. And a few weeks later, he was at home, unable to even stand up, couldn't even get up. And he was later diagnosed with two herniated discs in his back, one crushed disc. He didn't wrestle another match until WrestleMania when he dropped the title to Stone Cold. And it was another four and a half years after that before he would wrestle another match inside of a WWE ring. And I will always maintain, I, it, 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 I've always said this, it did not have to be that way. They already did two pay-per-view main events in the months prior with The Undertaker and Shawn Michaels. There was no need for a third. Owen Hart came back to the company after a few weeks away after all the Montreal stuff. They wouldn't let him out of his contract. Owen wanted to leave. They wouldn't let him leave. And they promised him this big push when he came back. I think they probably gave him a pay raise. Well, he showed up the month before and he attacked Shawn Michaels at the end of, you know, after his match at the last pay-per-view. Owen was getting the, the biggest push of his life at that point, at least for a few weeks. And instead of blowing off the match on an episode of Raw, which is what they did, they, they could have gotten one, just one. Owen wasn't going to win. They could have gotten one title match on pay-per-view between Michaels and Owen Hart before moving on to Michaels and Austin at WrestleMania. And the Rumble pay-per-view was perfect, even if you were of the opinion that Owen Hart was not a big enough star to warrant him getting a pay-per-view world title match against Shawn Michaels. And at that time, I think absolutely you could have done it. Because again, it was right after Montreal. It was still the hottest story in wrestling. Yes, absolutely you could have gotten a pay-per-view main event out of it. And on the Rumble, it, 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 that would have been perfect because it's all about the Rumble match anyway. You could have even headlined with the Rumble instead of the title match if you wanted to. But then I guess they wouldn't have been able to get their visual of the casket being on fire at the end of the show if they didn't do the casket. And so it ended up not... But, and that's not the reason why. There's still no good reason why they didn't do it. But I still maintain to this day that that should have been the match. And if it is, then you know what? Shawn Michaels probably doesn't get hurt. Iron Mike Tyson. He was a guest, though, at that show up in one of the sky boxes with the McMahons. Michael Cole interviewed him after the Rumble match. And Tyson was all excited to see his favorite wrestler, Cold Stone Steve Austin, win the Royal Rumble. Ah, yes. The Hall of Famer himself, Cold Stone following night on Raw, Tyson returned. This time for a special announcement Vince McMahon was about to make about his role at WrestleMania when who should interrupt but Cold Stone. Storms down to the ring and this led to the most, well, certainly one of the most famous face-to-face -face altercations ever in a wrestling ring for all the media attention that it got. Austin told Tyson, I don't know how good your hearing is. But if you don't understand what I'm saying, I always got a little bit of sign language. So here's to you. And he flipped him off. Mike Tyson shoved him back. A huge brawl broke out. The funniest part being Tyson's entourage, because he had all these guys with him, right, in the ring, mooching off of him. All of the members of Tyson's entourage are trying to pick up all the dollar bills that apparently fell out of Tyson's pocket in, in the midst of all this mayhem and carnage. Even as it was going on, like they're on the ground, like trying to scrounge up as many of the dollar bills as they can. 
But this was huge mainstream news at the time. I can remember even on my local ABC station here in New York. It was like during the, the 5 o'clock newscast the next day. I'll never forget it. It was Roz Abrams. Roz Abrams, she used to anchor the news here in New York many years ago. And she was talking about it. And they showed the video. And it was like, wow, look at that. It's on the news. Like To me, it was such a big deal. because, uh, Especially on the local news. That's how I knew. Boy, they must be covering this all over the country. WCW wanted Mike Tyson as well. They had been in negotiations with Oscar De La Hoya at that time to appear as a referee for one of their pay-per-view matches. And there was talk that maybe it would be uh, like for the, like a Rey Mysterio-Eddie Guerrero match because they wanted to try to bring in more of the Latin audience uh, to the product. And look, if you're going to bring in more mainstream fans, I guess the idea was what better way... I mean, yeah, you can use the big names like Hogan in that like they did with Rodman, but... If you're going to use this guy and try to bring in more of the Latin audience, what better way to hook people in than to put two guys in the ring like Rey Mysterio and Eddie Guerrero, who you know are going to go in there and they're going to just wow people. And they're going to put on this unbelievable show. And the hope would be that you hook them and then they'll stick around and then they'll see all the big names and all the big stars like Hogan and Savage and Sting and, and you know Goldberg and, and people like that. So, things fell apart. I think it was a case... If I remember, I think it was a case where uh, De La Hoya's people just thought wrestling would be bad for his image, like being associated with it. So, it didn't happen. Uh, but, w look, WWE getting Mike Tyson in 1998, as they were trying to get Steve Austin over as the next megastar, was huge. It was, it was to WWE in 1998 what getting Mr. T and Cyndi Lauper were to the company in 1984 and 85 in a lot of ways i think it's the, the same sort of thing wwe was no longer in jeopardy of going out of business by that point in early 98 um in 97 they were it was really touch and go there for a while once they started jacking up their pay-per-view prices amazingly people didn't stop buying the pay-per-views they were still buying them and they were spending more money and that's what really helped them stop the bleeding so they had already kind of turned a corner by that point in early 98. They were climbing out of that of that hole. And Austin was going to be their number one guy no matter what. But, you know, the way I would liken it, this was like turning a fire into a raging inferno. 22 years ago, on January 24th, 1999, Royal Rumble, no chance in hell, which was a reference to what Vince McMahon said Steve Austin's chances were of winning the Rumble match by putting a $100,000 bounty on the guy's head for anybody who would eliminate him. Anybody who would take him out. Little did anybody know, not only would that song become Vince McMahon's theme, but that he would still be using it over 20 years later. The Rock regained the WWE Championship. He had been playing hot potato with it with Mankind for a few weeks. He got the belt back in their I Quit match, which is one of the most violent matches in company history. It's hard to even go back and watch now the end of that match. Uh, and the match itself, it's too bad too, because the match itself is actually not a bad match. But it's tough, you know, knowing what we know and how unprepared Foley was for that number of chair shots and rock didn't hold back. There was no secret sauce to any of this. He was hitting this fucking guy in the head as hard as he could with that chair. Uh, it's tough. It's tough to go back and watch And It was even harder for Mick's wife and his kids in the audience to watch, you know, their husband and to watch daddy get his brains beaten in. And their whole their reactions were captured on video because at the time they were filming the Beyond the Mat, right? Remember the Barry Blouse theme Beyond, Beyond the Mat documentary, which Vince McMahon would, I think, come to regret granting them backstage access at the time. I remember when uh, they screened the movie for him when it was finished. I think they screened it for Vince and Linda McMahon and they were they were not happy. And they wanted no part of helping to promote it. They, they wanted to bury it, is what they wanted to do. Did not turn out the way that they had wanted it to or thought, I think, that it might. Yeah, because it wasn't a puff piece. That's why they didn't like it. But Foley said on uh, Steve Austin's podcast a few years ago, he said that first chair shot that Rock delivered to his skull 
He said, it hurt me all the way down to my toes. And there was only supposed to be four more for a total of five chair shots, but Mick fired up at the wrong time. He did something he shouldn't have, and he was firing up when he was still in the ring. He had his arms handcuffed behind his back. And they were still in the ring after the five chair shots. The plan had been for them to already be down the aisle way by that point. They were still in the ring. So they had to compensate, and all of a sudden, five chair shots turns into 11. And Rock had serious heat for a while with Foley after that match because Mick said Rock didn't come over to check on him in the back. According to Sean Waltman, Rock was actually very disturbed in the back when that match was over uh, about what had happened. Now, I've read that Rock did check on Mick. Mick just has no memory of it because the guy got his fucking brain scrambled. I don't know if that's true. I've, I don't even know where I saw that, but I've heard conflicting things about whether or not Rock did go over to Mick and check on him when the show was over. Mick seemed to think that he didn't. And he kind of held a grudge against him for a while. Eventually they squashed it and things are cool now between them. But he really was very unhappy for a while, for like months after that, uh, with Rock over what he had done. And in the Royal Rumble match, Stone Cold entered at number one. Vince McMahon entered at number two. They spent the majority of the match outside and brawling up on the concourse and into the men's room where he was attacked by all the other corporation members and laid out. China was the first woman. She became the first woman to ever enter a Royal Rumble match. That was the only memorable part of the match. The whole the thing with the 99 Rumble, completely forgettable. Outside of McMahon and Austin. It was the McMahon and Austin match. Everything else about it, aside from China being the first woman to enter, completely and totally forgettable. It's as if every every other person and every other thing that happened in that Rumble, which really was nothing was just a total afterthought. It was a complete and total afterthought. Until the very end, when the the real chairman, The Rock, helped McMahon win by distracting Austin, who got dumped out of the ring, I thought that the 99 Rumble was dreadful. The Rumble match. thought it was dreadful. We go from dreadful, though, to classic. The following year, with what I believe is the greatest Royal Rumble pay-per-view the company has ever produced. In the year 2000, from Madison Square Garden. Although I will not argue with you if you want to say that 2001 had the better actual Rumble match. But this show, it started out with the debut of Taz, becoming the first man to defeat Kurt Angle until Angle got the decision overturned the next night on TV. Taz came off like a total superstar here. It was all downhill. He never, ever reached the peak reaction that he had that night in the garden. It was just, unfortunately, he just became another guy on the roster and uh, ended up becoming a an announcer before he left the company. We had the first ever tables match between the Hardy Boys and the Dudley Boys. On this show, we had a classic street fight for the WWE Championship between Triple H and Cactus Jack. This is the match that I believe, in my mind, when I watched that, made me look at Triple H as a true main event player in this company. It got me to see him as credible at that level. This is the match that made him. I love this match. The second pedigree on the thumbtacks is an all-time great finish. Stupid. Very, very stupid. He could have blinded himself. But just such a great finish. And and one that, according to Foley, I believe, was not planned. The match was supposed to end after the first pedigree, but he called an audible at some point during the match and told Triple H to go ahead and pedigree him on the tax. And Vince McMahon was none too happy about that when Mick Foley got to the back because he was you know, for the same reasons that I just mentioned the hell are you thinking? Thumbtacks to the eyes? That could have gone horribly wrong. We also had the Miss Royal Rumble swimsuit contest, which is better left forgotten. You know what? On second thought, maybe 2001 is the best Rumble pay-per-view. <laughs> this one segment should probably disqualify this show from any kind of best of consideration. All you need to know is that it ended with Mae Young crashing the party and going topless and their attempts to place a giant red X 
on screen to block it out were unsuccessful. I don't care if it, I've heard it was pros, it was a prosthesis. They were fake breasts. There are a lot of fake breasts in that company at that time. None of them look like this. Prosthetics or not, it is one of the most haunting, disturbing things I have ever seen on WWE programming. And I watch Raw every week, okay? This, this segment here is just better left in the dustbin of history. And The Rock won the Royal Rumble match, only he really didn't. His feet touched when they weren't supposed to on the finish, and the big show really did win the Royal Rumble that year. He later on, they turned it into a storyline. Later on, he produced footage to prove it. Remember when he showed up on SmackDown that one week? I have footage. He had a tape in his hand. I have footage. <laughs> but it is indeed the 20th anniversary this week of the 2001 Royal Rumble on January 21st. Yeah, I wanted to leave some of this out. It's just so much to cover this week, but how could I how could I leave this out? The first WWE pay-per-view ever to be held in New Orleans, featuring the only ladder match in Royal Rumble history. I believe it's still to this day the only ladder match in Royal Rumble history. And one of the best ever between Chris Jericho and Chris Benoit for the Intercontinental title. I've always loved that Walls of Jericho spot on top of the ladder. And Stone Cold Steve Austin won his third Royal Rumble, outlasting Kane, who was the Iron Man of the match that year, lasting 53 minutes with 11 eliminations, which was a record at that time. Drew Carey, now in the WWE Hall of Fame because of this one match, eliminated himself. He had some kind of, I don't know, some kind of pay-per-view that was coming up at the time that they were promoting. Haku made his WWE return as a surprise entrant just one week after beating Terry Funk and Crowbar to win the WCW Hardcore title at their Sin pay-per-view. So that was embarrassing. The title was vacated after that and pretty much abandoned. See, that's what happens when you put a title on someone working without a contract. 13 years ago, on January 21st, 2008, Monday Night Raw aired for the very first time in high definition in Hampton, Virginia, the beginning of the HD era. They debuted a shiny new set created entirely out of video with over a million LEDs. The first major change to the Raw set since 2002 and the first star to make his entrance on WWE television in HD, Shawn Michaels. And finally... Six years ago this week, on January 19th, 2015, Sting made his Monday Night Raw debut, or I should say, the Vigilante Sting. That's what Michael Cole kept screaming over and over again, no doubt with the Irish madman in his ear. Sting had made his WWE debut at the Survivor Series, helping Team Cena beat the Authority, who ended up right back in power anyway a few weeks later. On this night, John Cena had the uphill task of facing Seth Rollins, Big Show, and Kane. And if Cena wins, Ryback, Dolph Ziggler, and Eric Rowan would all win their jobs back because they were fired by the Authority when the Authority was reinstated. And so all Cena had to do was win this handicap match and they would all get their jobs back. But, you know, I mean, three against one, that should be a piece of cake for John Cena. I mean, once upon a time, John Cena and Randy Orton, they beat the entire Raw roster. 17 to 2. So, three on one, I mean, that should be easy peasy. Late in the match, Sting appeared on the Titan Tron, which gave us the now infamous JBL line. That's not Sting. That's a picture of Sting. Because Sting, for whatever reason, they show Sting on the Titan. This was so dumb. They showed him on the Titan Tron. He's standing in that that like gorilla position area, looking at something off camera that we can't see. And maybe that was the idea. Let's pretend it's like a statue, I guess. And JBL will say, "No, no, that's a picture of like none of this made any sense. It was fucking dumb. <laughs> it was dumb. But at least hey, it gave us it gave us a classic line. That's not Sting. That's a picture of Sting. Until of course the picture started to move, and Sting walked through the curtain. 
into the building, then it was no longer a picture of Sting. He came out, he pointed to the ring when John Cena rolled up Seth Rollins from behind for the win. The distraction roll-up gets the win. It wins all of their jobs back. And for Ryback, it would be his last job for a major promotion. And that is the end of a very busy week in wrestling history. There was a lot to cover. That's a lot of ground to cover. I even that I still left some stuff out. But there were so many memorable events, infamous events, and important key dates that I didn't realize how important this week in history really was.